Dr. Joel Beakey is one of the most established Calvinists in the world. He has a PhD from Westminster Theological Seminary. He has written or co-authored over a hundred books, been the editor of two Reformed journals, and is the pastor of the Heritage Reformed Congregation, and was also the first president of the Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary, where he is currently the chancellor. Dr. Beakey is not a hyper or Reformed Calvinist. He is as mainstream as you get and should be able to speak as one of the most authoritative and accurate voices on the views of John Calvin himself, as well as the teachings of the theological system that bear his name, Calvinism. So when Joel writes a short book called Calvin on Sovereignty, Providence, and predestination, we should be able to say, here is a guy who knows what Calvinism is. He can summarize all of their teaching and clearly reveal the views of John Calvin. He is not a cage stage Calvinist arguing for Calvinism on social media with a very small level of understanding to back up his view. He's also not a black sheep of the community who has been pushed out of the ranks by other Calvinists. So if you want to know Calvin and the views of Calvinists as it relates to election, reprobation, and how God interacts with sin and sinners in his world, this short book should be the ideal place to start. And the interesting thing is, I think that this should be considered a must-read for both the Calvinist and the non-Calvinist. Let me tell you why. Welcome to Rev Reads. If you want to discover more books that will challenge your understanding of the gospel and how God interacts with his world, please subscribe to the channel in order to stay up to date with my most current reviews. Also, please like, share this video with others to help them know about the work of Dr. Joel Beakey. Calvinists will love Calvin on sovereignty, providence, and predestination. They will love the comfort Joel highlights from the doctrine of election. They will find the greatest amount of peace in the exalted language that is used to write about the sovereignty of God. This book has glowing reviews by the Reformed community online, and if you're Reformed, I think this short book could end up being one of your favorite books of the year if you've never read it before. Joel shows how election is the friend of the sinner who has been saved through faith, and reprobation is God's way to promote sanctification and humility in his people. So I think that if you're in that community, you're really going to love all of those aspects. And if you're reformed, I'm just saying here, I think that you're really going to love this book. I am confident that you'll start reading it and you will just fly right through it. And I'm also confident that if you don't want to hear a at times what might sound harsh review of this book, you might want to stop watching right here. But for those of you who are not Reformed, you will find this book not enjoyable, but eye-opening and enlightening. You will be highlighting this book throughout to mark Calvin's views regarding election and how God exercises his sovereignty in this world. In fact, you might find this to be a good book to give to someone who is considering Calvinism. In order to say to them, if you embrace Calvinism, if you embrace the teachings of Calvin, here is where it will end up taking you. And these are the kind of things that you might end up saying as well. And it isn't pretty. In fact, I found it kind of disturbing that someone can call these doctrines of grace comforting when you step back and look at the big picture of the whole of what Calvin wrote. In the first chapter, Joel covers sovereignty. And I found it ironic that he wrote, understanding God's sovereignty and predestination helps unravel confusion. Because I've personally found it creates more confusion. I mean, first over confusion as to what sovereignty is. He uses it so many times and in so many different contexts that it served more as a filler word than a word referring to the rule and authority of God. Now, you got to understand that for Beaky and Calvin, sovereignty is not God's rule over creation, but, Cal but sovereignty is God's directing over every area of creation, every creature's endeavor, and every aspect of of the believer's or anyone's life. 
So they say we should be able to have comfort because God is directing our lives and the events around them. But for me, I felt like Beaky stripped that comfort away as fast as he gave it because he then also quoted Calvin who said, whatever we conceive in our minds is directed to God's own end by God's secret inspiration. This means if someone plans to carjack you, beat up your kids behind the school or worse, God directed those thoughts in your attacker's mind. God is behind the mind of the one who opposes you and behind the mind of the one who opposes him. Calvin said he directed everyone by his secret inspiration. And I find it hard to experience comfort in God's plans if God is planning the thoughts and then the actions of every person in this world, including the world's worst deviants. He goes as far as to say that God has sovereignly decreed sin, providentially directs sin, and justly allows sin. God so directs sin that it glorifies him and even works for the welfare of his people. I don't believe God plans what God forbids. Even if planning sin will end his glory and our good, the end does not justify sinful means. And if it troubles you that God directs and decrees sin, because we know that God is holy and in him is no darkness, so you're looking for some explanation as to how God can plan evil, yet be holy, Beaky provides you with this answer. A holy, mysterious disparity between the two aspects of God's will. That it causes John Murray to write, It cannot be gainsaid that God decretively wills what he perceptively forbids, and decretively forbids what he perceptively commands. Which is basically to say they have no answer. It's a mystery as to how God wills evil, even though the Bible says on account of evil and wickedness, God's wrath is coming. So does that mean God's wrath is coming on account of his own will? I'm just not sure how God directing and decreeing sin is any different than God directly commanding it. I want to encourage you the next time you talk to a Calvinist about issues like this to ask them if they believe the word of God presents the Lord as the one who directs the depraved thoughts of sinners. I'm guessing a lot of them will say, no, the Bible doesn't, doesn't teach that he directs the thoughts of sinners. He, he allows sins. He directs the things that occurs in this world. But then show them Calvin taught that very thing. God doesn't simply allow sin. He wills it. He directs it. Then on the twin chapters on election and reprobation. I first feel like you could find comfort in the election chapter only if you didn't know the reprobation chapter was coming right after it. Because it's a joy to read. Election, then, is the friend of sinners. Not only because it guarantees our salvation, but also because it guarantees our conformity to Christ and his holiness. Along with, there is nothing more powerful than the sovereign, providential, gracious, one-sided, ever-flowing, over overflowing love of God. It's a beautiful thing that God chooses to save sinners. But when election occurs for no reason, now we all agree in the church that the goal of election is love to the person who is redeemed by Jesus Christ. But why someone is elected, Beaky proudly proclaims there's no reason why one is chosen for salvation and another is chosen for reprobation. According to Calvin, God's sovereignty, by its very definition, demands equal ultimacy in the sense that the will of God is just as much the ultimate cause of reprobation as it is of election. This means that the ultimate cause for someone's salvation, God's will, his choice to save them. The ultimate reason for someone's damnation, God's will, his choice to damn them. According to Beeky, God creates the believer for election to eternal joy in Christ, and God creates the unbeliever for eternal damnation for his glory. I can't rejoice in my election if that same doctrine also means God is crafting people for hell. I can't because first, I think it is unbiblical. The Bible says, for as many as receive Christ, those who receive Christ become his children. Not those who were created elect become his children, but whoever receives Christ is made his child. 
Now, certainly it's not by flesh and blood. It's not by our strength of what we do. It's not even by our will. And what that means is no one can demand salvation based on their own good works, the religion of Islam. You can only come to God according to God's will, which is by receiving Christ through faith. And also those who are damned, according to Revelation 20.12, are damned based on their own deeds and not based on God's reprobation. So I first can't rejoice in unconditional election simply because it is not biblical teaching. But I also can't rejoice in unconditional election, even if that means salvation for me, because then the God I placed my hope in, he no longer possesses a holy character. And I just can't trust his promises if he is electing and reprobating without reason, because that means he is also the God who is saying, you shall honor your parents and then directing the thoughts of children to hate their parents. So how can I trust in the God who forbids sin, but then wills and permits and allows that same sin? I can't place my hope in him. And I found it most sad how toward the end, Joel writes, no one who has a personal relationship with the God of unconditional election ever need say, no one cares. I do not matter. And that's beautiful to know that no one in this world should be able to say, nobody cares about me. I don't matter because of God. But if you believe in the God of unconditional election, there's a really sad flip side to that coin. Because those who were not picked by the God of unconditional election, they can never say, God cares about me and I do matter to him. Because God created them to destroy them and not to care for them. I don't believe the God of the Bible who sent his son Jesus because he loves this world is the God who created people to destroy them. I appreciate Dr. Joel Beakey's work because he reveals the true views of Calvin. And I hope this review, along with Joel's book, helps others to see both sides of Calvinism, both what it means for the elect and also what it means for the unelect and our ability to trust in his written word.